Thanks, candidates. Moving on, uh, next round of questions, we'll start with Eileen Brady. And Ivan, I believe you've got this one. All right. Uh, as Oregon and Washington shift away from burning coal, new proposals to make Oregon a coal exporting state have emerged. Plans are in the works to export at least 30 million tons of U.S. coal per year from ports on the lower Columbia River and another 10 million or so uh, tons of coal through Coos Bay. These proposals include the potential for multiple open-top coal trains running through neighborhoods in North and East Portland uh, uh, every day, as well as coal barges moving down the Columbia River past the city. What is your position on exporting coal through Portland? And we start with Eileen Brady on this one. Shouldn't be doing it. I've been making bold statements about the environment for a long time. Uh, a lot of this is going to reside at the state in terms of some of the conversations about it, but some of the things we can insist on is actually, if we're going, if we're going to allow it, it should be barged as opposed to put on rails in open top containers. I will, I, I will commit right now to working with at the state level to focus on the fact that we, just like with LNG, we should not be exporting coal out of Oregon. It's that simple. Charlie Hales. As was said earlier, uh, this, there is some imbalance of power here with both the federal government and the railroads in terms of how we approach this issue. So let's get specific about what the city can do. We can demand a, a complete and thorough environmental impact statement, and the city itself should get involved in that NEPA process aggressively on behalf of the community, on behalf of public health, on behalf of the environment. Then secondly, um, we need to you know, be using what leverage we have with the railroads. They need some things from the city they are almost a sovereign nation, but they need some things from us. And actually, I've had the experience of having negotiate with railroads uh, when we tried to get the, the steel bridge to have a bike and pedestrian path on it. It took, uh, I think, eight trips to Omaha to negotiate that with the Union Pacific. So this is a difficult issue. The city just needs to use all the influence we have, including with our congressional delegation, and be an activist player in the process. But we, of course, are not to use someone I almost never quote, the decider. <laughs> Doug Moore, you've got our next question. It's a short one. Oh, I'm so, I beg, Jefferson, I'm sorry. I already kind of answered the question. I should have given you a chance. I, I knew you would <laughs> ask it eventually. The, uh, so I gave my, already my concerns. What I'll add a little bit to is what we might do about it. Uh, and what we have to do is either stop or mitigate. And the levers that we have include, or that we might have include everything we've already said. It also means I think we have to robustly engage with partners, with every carrot and stick we Can you hear me OK? That is better? I'm all, often said I need to be louder. That's supposed to be funny. Uh, the, we have to work with partners. And one set of partners that could also be important is the legislature, not only because of state legislative authority, but because budgeting authority, including Connect Oregon grants, which go to railroad companies. And if we can get the Portland delegation, which includes multiple members of the Ways and Means subcommittees that are relevant in such things, that say, hey, no, this isn't going to happen unless blank then actually, in fact, having a mayor who had been a legislator and worked with a bunch of these people, and in fact, been elected by a portion of them to be among their leadership might be helpful. It's another reason not to be your mayor. Sorry again about that. Doug, will you uh, help us pick up here with uh, our sixth question? I'd be happy to. What form do you think the Portland Harbor cleanup should take? And this one, we begin with Charlie Hales. do that? There we go. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, one form is that we need to make sure that all of the polluters are at the table and inside the corral as we get into this issue. And the Department of Defense and Roan Palink and Arkema are, th those two businesses aren't here anymore, but they're still in business and they made Agent Orange and DDT here. They should be potentially responsible parties. So should the U.S. Department of Defense. So make sure that all those potentially responsible parties are involved. Uh, then, uh, as we proceed, to make sure the goal is a healthy river, not just 
sufficiency, but a healthy river. And then third, look for opportunities for early action where we agree on a plan for, say, a situation like River Mile 11 where we can start to actually take action in the river to start cleaning the river uh, and do that, of course, once the Environmental Protection Agency has given us a record of decision. But be ready for that moment when the record of decision comes down to actually start making real progress. You know, this is another issue in which we have already spent a great deal of money in planning, and that's appropriate that we do this right. But we need to get to the river itself and not just to planning what we're going to do. Jefferson Smith. We have to think not only in terms of the shape of the plan, but also who the planners are. And one of the distinctions in this race, if you look at the industrial users who are piling on money into the mayor's race, you can get a pretty good and quick assessment of to whom they are giving and to whom they are not. That matters because what is said in quieter rooms about what we'd be willing to do and not do, I can't be sure what everybody says, but I can be pretty sure about what I say. And what I say is, I am not going to promise that, in fact, a river plan in Oregon or that a cleanup plan in Oregon would, in fact, not have higher standards than what the federal government would say. I am not convinced that whatever math the industry-funded study came up with, with tens of thousands of carp or whatever it is, is the only science that is out there. And in fact, I will make sure that I am seeing science not only from the people who seem will be most likely to benefit financially from the results of the science that they provide. I will also make sure that we figure out the next generation of first citizens. Much of the political discourse in our city and our state was because we found really wonderful business leaders who cared about the whole thing, who were fiduciaries of the whole thing. So it wasn't only Audubon on one side and Greenbrier on the other, but we figured out trusted players so we could get somewhere. But to start, to get there, there has to be a chance that no is a possibility. There has to be a chance that we are actually willing to resist allowing the water to be any deeper, excuse me, any dirtier than blank. The other thing is pivot federal lobbying energy from a couple of fixated projects to more federal money for Superfund cleanup. Hmm. Eileen Brady. Well, I just have to jump in and say that I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to as it relates to campaign contributions, Jefferson. I just want to make sure that you understand that I say the same thing in every room to whether somebody's a contributor, whether they're a community member, or a, neighbor, a neighborhood organization. So I'm really proud of the extensive grassroots uh, contributions that I've had for, to my campaign. Actually, in fact, we almost have 2,000 contributions, which will, is probably the largest number of participants in a mayor's race in the history of Portland. As it relates to the Superfund, what's missing here is leadership. We can't actually just live with business as usual where we are waiting, for instance, for EPA to tell us what to do. What should have happened a, a long time ago, and when I'm mayor will happen immediately, is wherever we're in, at in this process, is the mayor of Portland has to step up and take a leadership role here. We're wasting valuable time. We are risking not cleaning our river as well as we'll be able to clean it. The mayor of Portland has to take a role in convening the partners. Again, we're talking about a complex issue. We have to convene unusual partners. In this case, it's going to be industry, it's going to be the port, it's going to be the tribes, it's going to be the environmental community. And we together come up with community consensus about which of those um, items on that menu of that the feasibility study has suggested we might be a part of. We need to find some community consensus so we can take hold of our own destiny and get that river clean. Uh, pardon me, next question uh, I believe is Andrea. Portland was an early leader on climate change and is one of the few cities in the nation that can say that it's actually meeting its carbon reduction goals. What new initiatives would you pursue for Portland's climate action plan to continue to re reduce carbon and meet those goals? Jefferson Smith starts us out. To some degree, it's a summary of what we've talked about. I think if you look at the key elements of climate pollutant drivers from industrial use to truck use to automobile use to home use to just consumption, we need strategies on each thing. So on homes. I do think retrofitting homes can help. I do think more use of renewables can help. 
I do think in public buildings, I've talked about that, I won't repeat it too much. On transportation, I think it's figuring out transportation projects that we can afford that shrink trips, also in terms of city planning that does likewise. I think we also, it is maybe the best argument for consumption-based taxation or even a carbon tax or congestion-based tolling so that we can actually start internalizing the uh, choice, the, the internalizing the, uh, the otherwise externalized costs based on indivi from individual behavior. Uh, the other biggest move I would make in addition to those, I'm thinking about, well, I, I said something about consumption. I guess I'll leave it there. I don't know if I'm allowed to reserve 30 seconds. Eileen Brady. I'm really proud of the climate action plan that the city of Portland's involved in. What you'll get with me is someone who's not afraid of the big, bold ideas and someone who's worked at the intersection of the economics, the environment, and social equity for 25 years. It is a tough intersection to negotiate. And I am absolutely excited about championing many of the action items we need for climate action, um, including bringing district heating to Portland. I sat on the POSI board, the Portland Sustainability Institute, where we helped launch the concept of eco-districts. It was an impossible idea when we started, and now we have five pilot eco-districts in Portland. The Lloyd District particularly is looking very seriously at a district uh, heating initiative, which they said couldn't be done, but we're gonna do it, and we've got some community consensus to do it. We need to redu reduce vehicle miles traveled, 20-minute neighborhoods, we have to commit to them throughout our city, including in outer East Portland. Those are two of many of the items that I'm very excited about getting started on. Charlie Hales. Yeah, I think we've, we've addressed a lot of these points um, already, but I, I think we have the plan. I mean, the issue is getting it done, getting the hard thing done. Can we start making progress against that plan? Uh, and that's the most important thing that we do, and we should be proud of what we've accomplished and continue to make Portland enough of a model that other cities follow our lead, because if they do, then we change the climate. We leverage change in other cities as well as accomplishing our own goals in our own bubble, as it were. Um, you know, that's a terrible analogy to use, right? Um, we want to be inside of a very healthy bubble, not the kind, uh, well, you know the old joke about climate change, right? What's sitting in your garage with the car running with all the windows closed? You know, climate change. We don't want to be that place. Um, so I think we need to redouble what we're doing. One, a specific thing I would add to the list, um, the city owns a lot of buildings. They are not the most efficient. Let's leverage the use of those buildings as more efficient ones, and also there's an awful lot of rooftops there that could support solar panels. And we ought to be a leader in that, too. Ivan, you have our next question for the candidates. All right. The, the city of Portland has been uh, very involved in the creation of community gardens and support for local sustainable agriculture. What would you do to further the city's role in encouraging a strong local and sustainable food system within the Portland metro region, better connecting Portlanders with the, our rural neighbors? And as fate would have it, we begin with Eileen Brady. Well, this is kind of just, this is what you get with me. I, I will be continuing my work on building local food systems no matter whether I'm the mayor or I'm working on any project. That's what I've been committed to my entire life. So um, I'm happy to say that Commissioner Fish is actually uh, planning to and believes he will get a thousand new community garden plots uh, inside the city of Portland in the next year. So that's very exciting. Uh, a couple of things that come to mind. One is we, have, we still have some food deserts or food, uh, small food deserts at any rate. I know that there's some discussion about that. Look at uh, 162nd Stark. We have an area where it's very hard to go to a neighborhood grocery store, uh, much less a grocery store that has local foods, local produce. We need to focus in, in those, that area specifically, and there are a few others. In addition, community kitchens is actually, I think, one of the next frontiers. And I am supporting a micromanufacturing initiative, including for food processing, as well as for the fashion industry and the advanced metals manufacturing industry. But if we had community kitchens throughout this city, we could actually have the equivalent of a CSA for processed foods like soups 
or salsas, et cetera. This could use the entrepreneurial energy that we have in our city. All of the young people here do not come here to retire, nor do they come here to make coffee. They come here to find meaningful work, and one of the things we can do is create these entrepreneurial activities. Charlie Hales. Yeah, I certainly agree with Commissioner Fish's goal. We ought to be innovative and relentless in trying to create more community garden space, use lots of partnerships. Again, the city and uh, our community has done an awful lot with partnerships. I've been very involved in Friends of Trees. I think Scott Fogarty is here. We should be proud of having planted 415,000 trees. Well, let's plant some community orchards in publicly owned property like that triangle at the corner of Vermont Street uh, and 30th that sat there empty all these years. If we could find some people in that community that want to plant a community orchard, same thing at 72nd and Woodstock. So let's look for some places where not only gardens can be managed by citizens who care, but also orchards. Then continue to hold the urban growth boundary tight so our farmers can get to farmers markets and something I've worked on for 10 years that I think we'll finally do, a permanent public market on the Portland waterfront. Thanks to Multnomah County's great partnership with us after all these years. Cheers to Jeff Kogan and the board for finally approving that great idea. Jefferson Smith. I visited Nick Fish two years ago and I saw the map of where community garden requests were. And I have been delighted actually. Well, that's too strong a word. I have been pleased occasionally that there has been greater focus on East Portland in this race. Maybe it is a coincidence that it is in part because I would be the first mayor elected in this city east of 82nd Avenue. But when I looked at his map of where the requests came from, it was relatively predictable. Almost none east of Tabor, not many east of 39th. And not because there weren't plots that might be available, and not really because there might be people who could make use of them. There is one about 170 feet from my house that is very well used. But because we don't yet have a, a strong enough network of communication and outreach and involvement and inclusion to make sure that our spread of community gardens is in fact the spread we hope for. Something else we have to not do, a distinction between Charlie and I in this race, is that I don't think we can afford to have a two-year across-the-board moratorium on systems development charges because I don't see how we're going to push a bunch of infill housing into places, allow for developers to do that, without asking them to pay their fair share for the basics, including parks, that would allow some of this to happen. I know it might be tempting in a down economy, but talk to us when, after in 2013, when it's a year later, it's 2014, and we still have that moratorium going. I agree that Charlie be ready on day one to do that. It's one of the reasons I don't want, no, it's one of the reasons I want to be mayor. We're at the last of the issues question, questions, and uh, Doug, I believe this one comes from you. Thank you. What would you do to build upon Portland's success in building a sustainable economy? I'm sorry, uh, we begin this time with Charlie Hales. I think maybe uh, the next wave might include um, getting some of these practices further into our local industry. We have a real manufacturing base here. So one of the things I think is healthy about Portland is we make things and sell them to the world. Uh, so looking for more of those ways to connect um, our policy with work. Let me give you a very specific example. Next door to my campaign headquarters is this wonderful little business called Bamboo Revolution. They started out by building uh, high-value uh, uh, construction projects, products uh, out of bamboo from China. Now they've planted five acres of bamboo in Albany, and they plan to plant more. So we'll have this perfect integration of land outside of the urban growth boundary, intended to grow things, growing things, that then are brought here to the city where people who have skills and markets make them into things and sell them to the world. I think we need to build a partnership with rural Oregon and not simply regard that as farmland and we hope they get to markets and forest land and we, hope, and we advocate for its sustainable management, but look for ways that we are actually adding value to their lives and their economies and making them more sustainable while we here in Portland, the model city, 
are making those products work for everyone beyond our borders. Jefferson Smith. We need an economic development plan that is focused on our distinctive strengths. Something that occurred to me as I was hearing these questions that almost seem like the same question. And I don't mean that they're repetitive. I mean that it's all part of a basic argument, a basic strategy that we need to have. And the thought that occurred to me is, I think the reason we have Gerding and Edlin in town is, lar is more because we have Waterfront Park than one can explain that we had Waterfront Park because we had sustainable developers. The most important thing we can do to maintain or create, develop a leading position in a clean tech economy is to be a great place to live. That's the best thing because that sends the most powerful signals we can possibly send. That's the brand that we all trade on. If word gets out that the air that we have is dirtier than most people think, that the water we have, that our river is dirtier than people think, if we have fewer stories that show how we're different than other people, and in fact, if we are different, we might be worse, there won't be that many more seasons of Portlandia. But let me get a little bit more specific. I was named the 2011 Small Business Champion for the work that we're doing to pivot some of our economic development attention from just trying to attract out-of-state businesses to what we can do to help cultivate and grow homegrown businesses. One example, Indo Windows. They make a removable window insert. Gives you about 95% the energy savings at 15% of the cost. We can help them find weather pattern information, deploy their, their small sales staff, and grow. Eileen Brady. Hear me? I think I lost me. There we go. My legacy isn't going to include many, many examples of how we effectively increase our sustainable economy. But I want to focus on one thing right now. I am the only candidate in this race that actually still believes we should do the Oregon Sustainability Center, we, that we should build it. Portland is a pioneer in sustainability, nationally and internationally. PSU is setting up centers of excellence because they want to be a world-class higher education system. They have an urban systems center of excellence that is going to show the world how do you create the best possible infrastructure, the most sustainable infrastructure for running a city, for living in a city. This building will be a platform for innovation. This building will allow us to incubate technologies and businesses for years to come that are innovative. If we're a pioneer in this, and this is where we've put our stake in the ground, why would we turn our back on this project? Just because something seems impossible is not the reason not to do it. In 1999, they said that having a locally-based food system was impossible in this day and age. Covering 100,000 children in Oregon with health insurance who didn't have it to start with, they said it was impossible. I do not think it's impossible. We can have, put this sustainability center in place and be a, continue to be a world-class visionary for a sustainable economy. Thank you, candidates. Mayor, I'm having trouble seeing the clock. Where are we right now? We are right on time for the closing statement. Magic. Um, it's, so it's out been of time real for everything else. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then. It's been a pleasure hearing a little bit more of all of your thoughts on these issues. And now we are down to closing statements. It'll be one minute apiece. Let's see, last time around. Jefferson Smith, you're up first. The watershed moment for me, maybe my political life, came at the beginning of this campaign when we were all clamoring for labor support and we were asked how we felt about the Clember River crossing. As a legislator with a good labor record, I was in the driver's seat to sweep the AFL-CIO endorsement. And the question came, what do you think about the project? And one candidate said, let's build that bridge, you guys. And the other candidate said, I'll get a project started in the first year. And I said with a lump in my throat, how are you going to pay for it? And are you sure it's the most important transportation priority in our lifetimes? With that decision, one of two things will happen. Either it was nice to meet you, or we will be able to shift again the political power structure in this city so that we actually can move in a direction of environmental choices that aren't only boondoggles and giveaways to people who can give a lot of money. The question I wish I would have asked, and had we had a chance to ask a question, it would have been, 
Would you agree with me to limit contributions in the general election to $250,000 apiece? Because I agree with the very first speaker tonight that too much of our politics is bought and paid for. And I need your help in this race so the environment and the public interest can win. Eileen Brady. I am extraordinarily honored to have a very broad group of endorsers and supporters. I have the endorsements of the most, tr most unions in this race. I have the endorsement of the Portland Business Alliance. I have the endorsement of the environmental leaders in this state, Senator Jackie Dingfelder, who I think might be here tonight, Representative Jules Bailey. We have an opportunity here. Oh, and I want to mention that I have the endorsement of the Portland Green Party, actually ahead of my friend Jefferson Smith and with Cameron Witten. I have an extraordinary breadth of support, and that support is built around this idea of sustainability, that we can have a livable city, we can have a lifestyle city that aspires to be the most environmentally conscious city on the planet, and we can do that while building a strong economy, by building jobs for our children. Thank you for having us tonight. Charlie Hales. Well, thank you all for your attention tonight and for this good dialogue. You know, we have done well. We should be proud of Portland. And my lawn signs say, love Portland. And that's not just a nice thing to say. I love this place. And I know what we have done, not only as a city, but as a state, with real